to see you guys come back from this. I'm happy because I've become a fan of the show, obviously, and I've known your work, interviewed you going back to GoldenEye and everything. It's good to see the growth of the characters. It's good to see what's happening with the series. How does that make you both feel? I'm thrilled to be part of this series. I'm thrilled to be working with Netflix. I think it's an incredible company that's hit just at the right time, really has their finger on the pulse, and so it's just it's nothing but upsides. We get to work with Eli Wall. Well. Uh, <laughs> we have a wonderful cast. We have, you know, a really incredibly creative team. Um, and we get to deliver shows that are on par with the best movies at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting for us. I mean, when Fonka came on board, you know, we needed someone that was really a bona fide, not just a movie star, but a, someone who's a terrific, terrific actress that could really anchor the show. And what's great about the fact that the first season was so wildly successful and we got to do the second season was with the first season we were really matching the episodes to fit the book. So we, we took 13 episodes and, we, and, we, and you could feel in certain episodes we were stretching it a little bit to try and get it to end where the book ends. But now in season two, we could really take the story in any direction we wanted, but we also knew that we could really, really write for Famke in a way that we couldn't before. And we were writing for the character of Olivia and obviously tailoring it towards her. But now that we didn't have the constraints of the book, I mean, the, the book is an incredible book and set up this amazing mythology with these fantastic, deep characters. But when you have an actor of Famke's caliber, you can really start to think, okay, in season two, like what is a, what kind of wild arcs and character turns and twists can we really, really write for her? And the nice thing about it is people are watching it as a 10 hour movie. You know, you'll see at 12.01 tonight, it'll go on the air on Netflix and I guarantee you 10 hours later and 10 hours and one minute later, there will be someone who has seen every episode. Um, so we, we really got to take not just a cinematic approach, but really write, write for Bob's acting strength. Uh, Hemlock Grove is very different from a lot of horror series out there. I think uh, you see elements of melodrama, kind of like Douglas Sirk. You see elements of Lynch. Could you talk a little bit about kind of you, the influences that kind of led you to create this series and maybe how it's different from other horror fare that's out there? Sure. Um, I think that Douglas Sirk is actually an amazing, amazing mm -hmm. reference and one that I haven't talked about. You know, when you watch the Todd Haynes film where he's referencing Douglas Sirk, I remember the first time I saw Written on the Wind, I, I couldn't, I was unaware of the joy of melodrama and how in my mind, in a strange way, I had categorized melodrama as bad writing or bad directing and not understanding it's a style in the way that you can read a serious novel or you can read a romance novel that fulfill different emotional needs for the viewer. And there's a certain incredible joy of escaping into the world but I think we don't want to go too far. I mean, we're not creating a melodrama. But obviously, David Lynch took the Douglas Sirk approach when he made Twin Peaks. He basically did the murder story via Douglas Sirk. So you, you have the heightened colors, the heightened emotions. And everything was very, very stylized. Like, if you look at, obviously, Fong was a very stylish person in the way she dresses and her approach. And, and, and we could look at all the characters and the details. Even the refrigerator in the house had to be something almost out of the 1950s. There was, you know, we were very, very particular in establishing a world that isn't reality. You know, I think that, you know, Walking Dead takes our world and sets it in an apocalyptic setting brilliantly. And the, and the fantastic element is the zombie element. You know, American Horror Story is sort of grounded in Los Angeles 2014, and then you go into a very dark, scary place where things from the past come in. And I think they're both brilliantly, very, very, very well done. Like, I, I love both of those shows. But what we wanted to do was take that storytelling and just have, have a whole universe where every character, the cars they drive, the clothes they wear, everything's just slightly right of, of reality. How do, stylized. Yep. How do you see um, Olivia's character changing this season? Is she kind of mellowing out? Well, mellowing out is not exactly the term I would use for Olivia ever. But because of what happened at the end of last season, her ending up in a body bag, you know, with her tongue ripped out by her lovely son. Uh, it just brings her back in a more compro compromised position and stripped of some of the control that she had. And the interesting thing is what happens when you take the control away from a control freak. I don't think they mellow out, but you do see different emotions that have never surfaced before, and that's kind of what we explored this season. So she is more vulnerable, 
Um, she maybe shows more anger at certain phones, but it's not an ice queen kind of, you know, control pers uh, uh, personification of a character anymore. There's a diff there are different layers, and we've been peeling them back throughout this whole uh, series. I mean, episode, sorry, season. I can't speak English, but... <laughs> You know, the, the, the funniest thing, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I remember in the first season, we, talk, we talked about Olivia, how someone who has been around this long and has the theatrical background that maybe the entire persona she has was adopted from someone. And in, in, yeah, I remember reading a biography of Jack Nicholson that said he took his personality from someone from Neptune, New Jersey. And I was like, wow, is that real? Or the way you can go to, I remember going to overnight camp, some guy had some catchphrase and you adopted it. Like... We like the idea that, that Olivia sort of took things from other people, but now in season two, you really started to strip away to actually get to the core of who this woman is and yeah. show a much more you know, human side now that yeah, she's more, more vulnerable. vulnerable. Yeah. You know, the, the strange thing is you are not aging. Do you know that? You've got the, the best skin, and no oh, matter yeah. what you can do to her, the, <laughs> it just she, can't. She you look the same from years ago. <laughs> 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 No, 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 the only thing that I can say is that other than I drink massive amounts of water, um, not good in a, in a city that is in a drought, but um, <laughs> I walk around with a parasol, so this, I just, the sun is one of the most aging factors, and I, for years I've tried, trust me, I've done the damage early on, because I grew up in Holland, and whenever we went south on vacation, it would be like, you know, olive oil, anything, baby oil, douse, douse yourself in it and fry. Um, but now I don't do it anymore. So it's the only secret that I have. Or not so secret. <laughs> Olivia is a very powerful character. Um, yet the show, on a whole, features a lot of violence against women. Um, how do you kind of view the role of women in a horror universe, and specifically in this series? Well, I think Olivia defies that. But I, I understand what you mean, because traditionally we've seen that a lot with uh, the horror genre, and it's something that I find to be particularly upsetting. But then I don't get to play those types of victimized parts that much and mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow don't get asked to do them, thankfully. Um, so I think that's a, a good balance in, in setting off, you know, the, on the one hand, the violence against women in that genre and then having a character like Olivia. But in, in this season, we really, we have Madeline Brewer, we have Madeline, a lot of Madelines, yeah, everybody yes. named Madeline, Madeline and Martin. they play really strong, interesting female parts. So that, I think, adds to know a different take on and I don't think we're a traditional horror genre at all I, I do believe that just like we've discussed Douglas Sirk, I think we have a lot of different elements in this um, in, in this show that sets it apart and uh, Eli kind of the same question I understand that uh, Knock Knock is in post right now and that is fe features women kind of perpetrating the violence on men so could you speak a little bit to um, personal experiences at home just, you know, I guess your kind of view on perhaps, you know, I think your work is maybe more sophisticated in the way that it kind of deals with women, whereas a lot of other horror films perhaps uh, simply put women as, as victims. Could you just speak to that a little bit? Well, uh, Knock Knock is a film that nobody really knows anything about, so anything you've heard is completely conjecture, and it's, it's way too early to, to discuss what that film's about. It's about many, many different things more about uh, the destruction of family uh, and the destruction of creativity, but that's a, that's a completely separate project. You know, I think that all you have to do is write intelligent characters and write good story. I, I noticed in Hostel, in all my films, I kill way more men than women, and people seem to have no problem with that. And then you, when a woman dies, everyone goes, how could you do this? And I think that, in general, it's a lot of critics and writers uh, are so afraid of s being seen as endorsing the violence if they like a story where there's violence, that it's much more about the critics saying, look at me, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, than actually truly being offended by something. And I'm more offended by bad storytelling. I don't get offended by whether they kill a man or whether they kill a woman. I get offended by lazy writing. I get offended when people aren't original, when they do the same crap you've seen over and over and over, or when you see two thirds of a good movie and it falls apart in the last third. That's when I get offended, because I feel ripped off, I feel like I've invested my time in a story and it doesn't have a clever resolution. And I think it's, it's very easy to write half good scripts or two thirds scripts and it's very hard to write something that's very smart from start to finish. So um, I think that 
you know, it's one of those things where, you know, hearing a guy scream and hearing a girl scream, there's just a more visceral primal reaction when you hear the girl scream. It's like when you, when you watch a show, I mean, there's 90 seconds of torture in a hostel, but the blood stains your eyes so much that's all people see. And I understand that, but I think that the key is writing great characters, writing great story. I mean, if you can make that argument about anything, you can say, oh, The Exorcist, or oh, Jaws is violent skin. You can look at every single story you want and say it's violent skin for women. But if you want to be realistic about it, I think what's way more offensive is, you know, seeing all the way girls are, 15-year-old girls are posting themselves on Instagram and writing Thinstagram and look at how skinny I am and creating a culture where if you're a 14-year-old girl, you probably have an eating disorder from watching all the celebrities reward themselves, how society rewards celebrities that starve themselves beyond the point that it's, it's, it's just so completely absurd to me. And that there's like there's sort of no that like there's absolutely no outrage about that which is actually causing body dysmorphia amongst millions of young girls whereas watching a story in a horror movie people just take it as a story in a horror movie. What do you hope the audience gets out of seeing this season? I hope that people are and your character <laughs> entertainment. I really want people to just go along for the ride. It's it's really a unique show unlike any other one out there in the, at the moment. It's. You know, like we discussed, highly stylized. It has really great, smart writing, character development, interesting, you know, Shakespearean type relationships between family members and inter, you know, connections between various class systems in within this little town. Um, it has, you know, some nice bloody gory moments for the people who like that kind of stuff. Uh, so I think it has a unique tone. Yeah, we, we want to have an amazing, original, creative, entertaining ride. We wanted to create a show that you couldn't see anywhere else. And that's why Netflix has been so great. It's yeah. because not only, not just in terms of the limits of whatever sex or violence we, we need to tell an episode, but in terms of not having to recap, not having to have commercial breaks, we could really approach it, everything like a movie. And we have fantastic, fantastic uh, feature directors that came in. Spencer Susser, who directed Hesher, Flory Sibismondi, who directed... The Runaways, Vincenzo Natale, who directed Cube and Splice, and uh, you know, just just to review, David Strait, our director, like we, we had amazing directors that came in, um, and that's what we want. We want a show that isn't television. We want someone to go to escape into this universe and come out with some kind of, kind of ownership of their characters. You know, I think that every generation wants to have a show that's their own show. You know, in the way that like Friday the Thirteenth, I loved it, but then. The generation younger, Scream was their movie, and then the generation younger that, The Ring was their movie, and then the generation after that, Hostel was their movie, and then the generation after that, Paranormal Activity is their movie. You want a whole wave of, you know, of people that watch the show, and they're like, Hemlock Grove, that's our show, we love it. And so far, the fan response on Twitter, on Tumblr, on Instagram, the, the, the artwork people are creating, it's really inspiring people to draw pictures and make their own videos and, and get into the show, and that's what's fun about creating a world like this, is you can just... I love mythology. I love monster mythology, and I love it when the creators take the time to really, really get the details right and stick to the rules that they set up, and not just change them and not just abandon them. And and that's what's uh, you know, any of those great shows, whether it's Buffy or Walking Dead, you know, the the creators really, really cared about the universe and mythology. Guys, I have to uh, wrap it now. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.